Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar of 2018, A View of Organizational Knowledge. My name is Katie Boone. I'm the Marketing Manager here at NSF for the ISR Group. I have the pleasure of introducing two speakers today. First, we have Don McFarlane. Those of you that have been on past webinars will recognize Don as our Aerospace Technical Manager and, and Auditor for the Aerospace Division here at NSF. He has also worked as a quality engineer, quality director, facility security officer, consultant lead auditor, and auditing instructor. Thank you, Don, for joining us again on these webinars. Our second speaker is Martin Willem. Martin is the business unit manager for the QMS program here at NSF. He has 18 years in the third-party certification business covering a wide variety of functions, including auditing, training, public speaking, mentoring, and operational management, both domestic and international. Prior to that, Mr. William had eight years of industrial engineering and quality management experience at organizations serving the aerospace, automotive, and metal fabrication industries. A few notes about today's meeting. Everyone will be muted during the call. If you have any questions at all during the presentation, please use the chat function to reach out to me, and we will run through the questions at the end of the session. There will be a follow-up email that everyone will receive that will have a link to the full presentation as well as a downloadable copy, PDF copy of the slides for your team to reference at any point. Thank you so much for joining us today on the call and our support for NSF International. Go ahead and take it away, guys. Katie, thank you for that glowing introduction again. So uh, my name is Don McFarlane, I'm the technical manager for the aerospace group. I'll be conducting a majority of the session. Marty's going to jump in, and uh, Mike McRandall's going to jump in as time permits as well, or as the need arises. So with that, we'll get into the uh, content. And for those that have joined us on previous webinars, you'll recognize a similar format. We have our transition plan benchmarks. We'll just hit some of the highlights associated with that. Uh, the organizational knowledge citations, the implementation thoughts associated with organizational knowledge, and then we'll get into our Q&A. Um, for clarification, we, we've recently expanded our uh, audience to include the ISO community, the QMS community. Um, originally, these webinars were set up for the aerospace community at NSF, and that's why you're seeing kind of a bias towards the, the aerospace uh, theme on the slide deck. Um, we'll address that for future webinars, but for this one, it was just too late in the game to make that transition, so bear with us. Um, with that said, we'll get into the transition plan benchmarks, and really there's only a couple left here. Um, the first one is associated with the day that we're, we're targeting to have all of our upgrade audits completed. As we know, we've drawn that line in the sand at June 2018, and the intent is um, all audits have to be conducted and closed and new certificates issued um, before 9.15 because that's the date that the existing standards ride off into the sun sunset. So what we're looking to do is give you, the client, enough time to complete your audits, any associated nonconformities if they're issued, and the, uh, the CB review type activities. And in order to do that, the, the industry has asked for about 90 days, so 60 days for corrective action closure, some time for the CB activities to occur, which takes us back to about that June time frame. So that's the reason for the June date. Um, that shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone because we've been messaging that for quite a while through various uh, forums and different media. But that's really the extent of the deadlines that we have left. If you haven't scheduled your transition audits at this point, um, work with your account managers. Um, if you're not an NSF client, contact one of our business development managers and we'll see what we can do to help you out. With that, we'll get into the organizational knowledge citations. And this is direct out of the ISO 9001-2015 standard, which is also the same uh, verbiage that's in the AS 9100, 9110, and 9120 standard. They're in clause 7.1.6. So what you'll see is a screenshot of the uh, citation direct from the standard. I'm going to read that to you, and then we can talk about how we implement that here in a few minutes says the organization shall determine the knowledge necessary for the operation of its processes and to achieve conformity of the products and services. The knowledge shall be maintained and made available to the extent necessary. 
And then when addressing changes or changing needs and trends, the organization shall consider its current knowledge and determine how to acquire or access any necessary additional knowledge and required updates. Uh, within the note, the first note there, you'll see it's knowledge specific to the organization. It's generally gained by experience. It's information that can be used or shared to achieve the organization's objectives. Another name for this, tribal knowledge. Um, organizational knowledge can be from internal sources or from external sources. You see the, the various links there, the various citations for the internal sources like our IP, intellectual property, stuff that we learn over time uh, from experience, lessons learned from failures or even successful projects, um, capturing and sharing undocumented knowledges or knowledge and experience, improvement projects, products and services, etc. And on the external side, it includes the standards, academia, the conferences that we attend, maybe learning um, knowledge based on our customers or from other external parties or external providers or our interested parties. Um, because anytime we see somebody's name tarnished in the media or praised in the media, we want to do or emulate those behaviors so that we uh, either take a similar path or go down a different path and avoid being tarnished in the media. So those are all sources of, of knowledge that we can consider. Um, one of the uh, tools I like to point out to everybody is the evaluation guidance material from the IAQG. And this describes things that we should be considering. So in particular, regarding organizational knowledge, it tells us that we should consider the organizational approach towards the determination and capture of knowledge, including, for example, planning for knowledge capture or how we gather it, um, whether it's from the knowledge management planning, present and future needs, sustainability, sources, approach, ownership, timeliness, et cetera, um, how we gain the knowledge from experience, whether from development planning or succession planning, having some subject matter expertise or, or um, centers of excellence, mentoring programs, coaching, et cetera, and then knowledge acquisition through intellectual property, patents, lessons learned over time, explicit and tactic knowledge, and we'll talk more about that, professional memberships, industry associations, benchmarking, it's huge, uh, conferences, communities of practice, et cetera. It also suggests that we maintain and share organizational knowledge or knowledge management system, electronic media, internet, database, repository, libraries, et cetera, associated with um, taking these lessons learned and, and ensuring that we don't lose sight of that or don't lose focus on um, what we've gone to the school of hard knocks to learn. Um, so that's really the extent of the the citations that we've found. Um, it's not a not a very in depth section, but it has a pretty significant meaning and a pretty significant connotation. And more importantly, it has a big benefit to your organization if it's implemented correctly. And it's no accident that it was implemented um, in this revision of the standard because there's a lot of these external conditions that are, are, we're facing right now, and we'll talk more about that. Um, so it's important for us to capture the knowledge so that we can uh, retain some of that through these, these external pressures. Um, with that, we'll talk about some implementation thoughts. Um, so first slide here, have a, a great picture, a great little quote there from Winston Churchill that says, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So I know you're asking why should I care about this or, or what's in it for me? And the answer is we hire experienced staff and we should certainly capitalize on their experiences so that we're not making costly mistakes. We pay for the talent so that we don't have to make those mistakes to learn lessons. Why not capture their expertise and ensure that we're, we're avoiding those mistakes? Uh, in addition to that, turnover is a reality especially in today's marketplace or employment marketplace specifically, um, whether it be planned or unplanned turnover. Um, and what I mean by that is re retirements or terminations. Um, critical and valuable knowledge is lost as a result of turnover. We want to make sure that whether it's a planned or unplanned event, we don't have any of that tribal knowledge that is um, leaving the facility with the employee or information that's held hostage by a particular employee that leaves. Um, and we'll talk more about that as well. 
So we, we all have something within our organization that's important to our success. We want to make sure that we're capturing that knowledge so that if somebody gets hit by the bus, to use that in proverbial sense, or more positively, wins the lottery, um, we're still going to be successful as an organization in spite of them not being there. So timely conversation piece. Um, some interesting statistics that I found for, for the current labor market it says that the U.S. Department of Labor reported about 6.2 million jobs were unfilled in 2017. That's a lot of positions that are sitting vacant, either waiting for the correct candidate um, and not wanting to put an underqualified person in that position, or for something that they just flat out didn't have the skill set uh, developed for. Um, while it's not the only factor, there's certainly, I think no one would argue that there's a skills gap that exists um, for some of the technical skills and some of the trades that, that aren't being taught as thoroughly or as, as widely as they once were. And it becomes uh, certainly a problematic if we want to hire the right candidate. So it's kind of forcing us into hiring a, uh, what I've dubbed here, a less than ideal candidate to fill that position. Um, in, in addition to that, it's estimated that 2.7 million additional boomers, and we'll talk about the baby boomers generation, um, but about 2.7 million additional boomers are going to retire between now and 2025, and all of the knowledge and expertise that they've gained through their careers is going to go with them. Um, the interesting tidbit associated with that is that the rate of boomers leaving is faster than millennials, which is the current generation, um, that's faster than millennials are entering into that labor market. So it's going to even widen that 6.2 million unfilled jobs gap even further. Um, and this is obviously a bigger problem than, than what we're facing here, so we identify this as a risk, and now we're looking to implement actions associated with addressing that risk. So before we can do that, we should really understand what is organizational knowledge. Organizational knowledge is, uh, as it says, nor, uh, knowledge that is collected and used to improve or achieve context-driven objectives and prevent a repeat of historical mistakes. So we capture those lessons learned and ensure that we don't make the same mistakes again. In addition, it's inconsistently applied, uh, excuse me, it's an inconsistently applied definition, uh, and there's a lot of different schools of thought as to what it could be or what it may be, but the basic concept is fairly universal across um, all the different definitions that I've found. Um, it says maybe based on explicit or tactical knowledge, and we're going to talk more about what that is here in just a second. So as we think about knowledge, there's really two, two sides of this that, that are important for this conversation. We have the explicit knowledge and the tactical. The explicit knowledge is objective and rational in nature. It's theoretical approaches, manuals, databases, stuff that we can see. So looking at this iceberg example, this is what we can see above the water. So we're observing this, whether through observation, through experimentation, through um, you know, documentation. And then there's the tactical stuff that we can't see, but we theorize based on what we see up here what this looks like. Um, we've never been on Pluto, we've never been on Mars, but we have a pretty good understanding of what the surfaces look like based on some observations. We don't necessarily know all the, the intricacies of that. We don't know the intricacies of all of the surrounding solar systems because we haven't been there, but based on what we know of our existing um, explored territory, we can theorize what the rest of the, the solar systems look like. And that's really the the... Uh, iceberg metaphor that we're talking about here. We understand an event based on a view of a different thing or event. So again, explicit is that objective and rational. Tactile is the subjective and experimental. Can't necessarily be expressed in words, procedures, sentences, numbers, or formulas. It's more belief-oriented or Im imaginative, um, perspective-based thinking you know, some of that, that know-how that, that comes with experience. Um, so that's the, the key difference between a tactical and explicit. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on, on this, but there's a model that's been created by this professor, Nanaka, uh, back in 2010, or it was presented by him 
in 2010, um, but it's the SCCI model, the socialization, externalization, internalization, and combination model. And it's, it's really addressing the different opportunities for us to capture the knowledge and the methods that we're capturing it based on the type of knowledge, whether it's that tactical or the, or the tactic knowledge or the explicit knowledge, and, and what we're going to do or, or the proper methodologies associated with that. So if you haven't really looked into this theory a whole lot, I would certainly recommend it. Um, and it's a matter of defining the organizational knowledge or creating that organizational knowledge and then utilizing the tools that you have in place to, to implement it further. Again, a great resource, certainly one that you would want to read more in depth in your spare time. Um, for knowledge management or creation, to summarize it though, it, it's driven by providing vision or driving objectives, which could include our context, our interested parties, and maybe the internal and external issues. Because again, we, we need to understand that so we understand who cares about our organization, what they care about it, and why they care about it. And once we understand that, we can ensure that we've captured the right knowledge in order to maintain our uh, customer base, in order to maintain our product integrity or whatever it might be. So having a good understanding of that organizational context piece is going to help us to ensure that we're um, creating and retaining the right knowledge rather than just retaining information for the sake of capturing it. Um, in addition, cultural acceptance of enabling and promoting knowledge creation through team-based discussions and practices is important. We've talked a lot in previous webinars about the importance of culture and why it's important for us to have a successful culture within our organization. And one of the aspects of successful cultures is that we have an us versus me ideal. Um, if, if I'm in an organization where it's all about me and I'm, I'm capturing knowledge so that I can make myself more valuable, but I don't share that knowledge with other teams or other processes or other groups, um, I may be hampering our growth. I may be hampering our ability to be successful even though I'm doing well. Um, because again, if it, I'm doing something well for me, I'm not helping the business, not helping other areas, we may be losing all of the money that I'm gaining from my processes or my, my growth um, through those other work centers. Um, and yes, tactical and tactic are the same thing. They're the same knowledge base for that question that popped up. Um, the next item here, making informed decisions in the best interest of the relevant interested parties. Uh, again, back to the, the slide of the iceberg, we don't always know the right answers. Sometimes, oops, wrong one. Sometimes we have to theorize. Oh, I'm struggling here. There's the slide we want. Sometimes we have to theorize what this portion looks like in order for us to be successful. We know this, but we theorize the rest of this, right? So if I'm using that, um, I have to make informed decisions in the best interest of those relevant parties, and, and we do make those decisions based on what we know. If we can know the actuals, we're going to use that. But if we can't, we're going to use the most informed set of information to make that decision. And it's important that we capture that theoretical knowledge from everybody instead of just an isolated group. Decisions made in a bubble are definitely less productive than informed decisions made by the group. I'm not advocating you know, committee-based decisions. Somebody has to have accountability for sure, but we certainly want to make those decisions informed uh, along the way. Um, includes tribal knowledge. So we know that tribal knowledge um, is another term for organizational knowledge, or tribal knowledge is a, a facet of organizational knowledge, better stated. Um, we're going to have a, a ton of tribal knowledge associated with our organizations. And we may be using some of these different methodologies associated with capturing that tribal knowledge um, so that we don't um, lose it, um, so that we, we can train new people on how to do a particular task that, that is so critical. that we, we detail it into a formal training because we want everybody to do it the same way over time. 
um, or we maybe for something that's done really inconsistently or there's super critical operations that occur, we have a traveler that's going to detail the specific sequence or interact or excuse me, sequence or steps that have to occur and, and create kind of a recipe associated with how we build it right or build it, uh, excuse me, do it right or execute the service correctly. And maybe a task checklist associated or we may have a database that helps us to retain. It could also be a combination of all of the above. What we're trying to avoid really is what's shown in that uh, comic over there that Johansson has, has kept all of his or kept his job over these years because no one else has all of his critical knowledge. Um, if he's not the right player, we don't want to retain him just because he has the knowledge. Or what happens when Johansson does leave and takes all of that knowledge with him, right? It's kind of two facets to that. Um, the, the image here is selected pretty specifically, and, and I want to talk about that. The, uh, you, you've heard the parable of the pot roast, I'm, I'm sure, but it's that the, uh, this, this girl was cooking a pot roast one time for her, her new family, and um, she cut the end off the roast and decided that she wanted to, or wanted to cook this roast just like her mom had done it. So she cut the end off and put it into the pan and then cooked it up. Well, somebody else was in the room and asked her, why did you cut the end of it off? And she said, I don't know. That's what my mom always did, so that's just how I know how to do it. Well, finally, she went back and asked her mom about why, why the end of the roast was cut off. And the, the mom said, well, it's simply because I didn't have a pan big enough to put the roast in. So we had to cut the roast in half to put it in the pan. So rather than cutting the end off the roast when we don't necessarily need to because that's cost and waste, we, we want to make sure we're, we're understanding the reasons why. Um, so the focus here is in relation to human factors. Um, and I, I tell that story in advance because it's going to play into this a little bit. So the, the first bullet here says, in the culture of fear, knowledge sharing is limited to promote per, uh, personal value or worth in the interest of self-preservation. I, I would imagine that a lot of people are shaking their head yes at this point because they've seen that or lived that in a past life or maybe their current employer. Um, as we know, human factors kind of goes against that. It says culturally we need to find a, a way for us to capture um, or create a culture that we can eliminate that fear. Everybody needs to be able to stop the launch. Everybody needs to be able to uh, ask the question without fear of repercussion. Um, so in this case, we need to be able to ask why the end of the roast is cut off, or maybe it's why we're processing this product in a certain sequence because it's adding an extra labor step or an extra wash process or an extra um, handling step that creates an opportunity for damage. So understanding that is important, and using the human factors program to its benefit can be uh, certainly of value. Um, the next bullet I've listed, how hard can it be? A lack of knowledge of past lessons. Um, so we, we don't necessarily understand the intricacies that have gone into creating a particular program or project. And as a result, sometimes people look at projects and, and you know, underestimate the complexity or the risk associated with it. And that can be uh, one of those human factor elements of um, lack of knowledge. We, we don't necessarily understand the intricacies that have gone into creating that. And as a result, we may miss critical steps. We may not be able to repeat the recipe. And it could put product at risk. So it's important to, to understand that aspect. And obviously, the organizational knowledge that we would capture would directly impact the quality of the product. Um, so we want to make sure that we're addressing the human factors piece because it's going to help to contribute to the organizational knowledge retention. Um, the last one here is complacency, which comes right off the dirty dozen list as well. Um, and if you, if you don't know what a dirty, the dirty dozen list is, uh, we'll show you the link to the webinars. We've got a great one on human factors that we've done recently. I would certainly recommend it. Even if you're an ISO company and you, you don't have an invocation for considering human factors, times are changing, human factors are real, probably time for you to look into it and at least consider that as part of your company, as a part of your culture. Um, the last bullet again, complacency, says the way we've always done it without the knowledge of why. 
So, again, going back to the parable of the pot roast, we eliminate waste and, and um, cut, stop cutting the end off the roast. Um, if we don't have the knowledge of why it's done, it's going to be tough for us to challenge the norm and understand what steps are critical and what steps have to be done. Um, so it's tough to innovate or improve the processes if we truly don't have a good understanding or if we're complacent and, and say that everything has to be done. Now, I'm certainly not advocating that we just make change for the sake of change. Change has to be controlled. It has to be approved. It has to be considered. And the standard's very specific on that. There has to be a methodology associated with these changes so that we're not causing harm or deleterious effects to the product, to the service integrity that we're, we're providing. Um, but we need to be willing to challenge the norm so that we can improve our product or our service to make it better, faster, cheaper, or stronger. And, and really considering these human factors are going to help us to do that. And it's going to help us to understand the organizational knowledge needed to drive that continual improvement. So the next slide talks to how we get organizational knowledge from other entities. Um, as we, we mentioned earlier, if a competitor has an issue, we certainly don't wait until we are also exposed to prevent a similar, or similar occurrence. Meaning if one of our competitors or uh, somebody that we uh, hold in high regard is tarnished in the media, we probably look internally to make sure that our ducks are in a row um, before we get put into the limelight as well. Um, so I, I pose the question, would they not then interested parties that we should consider? Um, or could we be interested parties of them uh, because they want to benchmark off of us? And I'm not saying or suggesting that that has to be documented as an interested party, but it's certainly something to consider that the, the community at large or maybe our competitors are interested parties because chances are if you have a, a failure, they're going to capitalize on that and probably take some of your market share. So they probably have an interested interest in your success or your failure, and um, we want to safeguard the knowledge so that they don't have that information. The next bullet speaks to customer feedback or satisfa satisfaction data, including returns. Um, and that can be used to indicate that things are good or bad, things that are positive or negative, And it can help us to drive that improvement associated with our process. Because if our customers are continually telling us that um, your customer service team is excellent, but your um, shipping department is terrible, that's information that we should be utilizing to drive that knowledge or driving, drive the improved behavior. And if there's a particular person that's within that group that does better than others, perhaps we consider that and ensure that they or their, their best practices are um, captured. Um, the next item on the list is, is again, benchmarking. Because, again, there, there are best practices that are employed by um, competitors, different industries, different companies. And we want to capitalize on that, understanding what the other people do well and maybe what they don't do well. Because every, everything that we see or do or experience is, is considered or could be considered organizational knowledge. It's all shaped us to, to get to where we're at. So if we're not learning from our mistakes, again, history is doomed to repeat itself. Now, with that in mind, I want to show you this video from a guy named Jocko Willink. He's a, a motivational speaker, retired Navy SEAL commander. Um, he's got some excellent podcasts. One of his recent books called Extreme, uh, Extreme Ownership. Um, just a phenomenal speaker, phenomenal presenter. But this one kind of hit home and was, was so impactful for this discussion. So I'm going to play the video. If you don't have the sound on on your computer, I would recommend that you turn it on real quick. Um, because again, it, it's otherwise it's going to so just staring at a screen. So make sure you've got your sound turned on, and I'm going to play the video for us. One of my direct subordinates, one of my guys that worked for me, he would he would call me up or pull me aside with some major problem, some issue that was going on, and he'd say, "Boss, we got this and that and the other thing." And I look at him and I'd say, "Good." And finally, one day he was telling me about some issue that he was having, some problem, and. He said, I already know what you're going to say. 
And I said, well, what am I going to say? He said, you're going to say good. He said, that's what you always say. When something is wrong and going bad, you always just look at me and say good. And I said, well, yeah. When things are going bad, there's going to be some good that's going to come from it. Didn't get the new high-speed gear we wanted? Good. Didn't get promoted? Good. More time to get better. Oh, mission got canceled? Good. We can focus on another one. Didn't get funded. Didn't get the job you wanted. Got injured. Sprained my ankle. Got tapped out. Good. Got beat. Good. Learned. Unexpected problems. Good. We have the opportunity to figure out a solution. That's it. When things are going bad, don't get all bummed out. Don't get startled. Don't get frustrated. If you can say the word good, guess what? It means you're still alive. It means you're still breathing. And if you're still breathing, well then hell, you still got some fight left in you. So get up, dust off, reload, recalibrate, re-engage go out on the attack. So the reason I share that video is I think there's some, some good that can be gained from benchmarking of best practices associated with good and bad activities. Um, so it could be the best of the worst, if you will. And we learn from it. We can take those as learning opportunities to ensure that our processes, our knowledge, our training programs are improved so that we don't make the same mistakes. Um, utilizing that same good type philosophy, we want to capture what works well and what hasn't worked well for others and ensure that we're learning from those mistakes. Um, moving along. Organizational knowledge, relationship to risks and opportunities. Obviously, this is scalable and based on the organizational context because we're going to consider all those things. But we would want to ensure that our organizational knowledge is defined or identified as a resource because it truly is, and it's under Section 7 for a reason. And it's applied to our resources as well. So we're, we're capturing all of this organizational knowledge. That becomes a resource to our organization that can be applied to our human resources, maybe to our um, experience uh, or our competency programs. It could also be applied to our environment. It could be applied to our infrastructure to ensure that we are uh, driving the continual improvement of our best practices. Um, Organizational knowledge should consider uh, and use to help address the needs and expectations of our interested parties. It says, would a gap in knowledge or tribal knowledge be considered a risk? And I think we're all shaking our head, absolutely it is. If we lack the knowledge associated with something or if we lack tribal knowledge and haven't learned that lesson, there's certainly a risk of us making bad parts, delivering a bad service. Um, on the flip side, would additional needs or expectations considered or be considered an opportunity? And the answer is obviously yes. If, if we identify something that um, through the, the organizational knowledge piece, if there's additional information that we have, maybe a service offering that pairs well with this, or we know that uh, if the customer is going to want to go through this line, this product, this, this uh, program, then we need to offer these other service offerings in order to get them or this other certification in order to get there. Um, those would be opportunities to consider for our, us as a business. But that's going to help us to grow and help us to expand and help us to get better. So there's definitely a relationship between the two. It also says it's used to mitigate the lessons learned and prevent recurrence, um, which is the same intent with the risks and opportunities. We capture what could go wrong or what has gone wrong, and we address those. So those best practices can be 
captured and then shared across a, a platform with multiple teams through that risks and opportunities FMEA or spreadsheet or whatever methodology you're using to address the um, risk-based thinking aspect, or for those that are AS, the uh, organizational risk piece. Uh, organizational, or excuse me, organizational knowledge relationship to corrective actions. Um, we know that corrective action is a tool for addressing those significant issues. So if we identify a significant gap that exists, or maybe it's a, an insignificant gap, but it's systemic in nature, we can certainly take a corrective action utilizing that, that problem-solving methodology for fixing it before it becomes even more serious. Um, we, we can address those through that effective corrective action, sustain the improvements, and address the underlying causes versus just addressing the symptoms. Um, using a, a kind of a, the old cheesy fire analogy here, if we just put the fire out without taking away the lighter, chances are the fire is going to come back. So we, we use the corrective action to help us address the lighter, take away the lighter, but the organizational knowledge piece can help us to understand why in addition to that root cause tool. So there really is a lot of correlation between these two programs. Some final thoughts for me, and then I'll let uh, Marty or Mike jump in if they have any comments. Uh, first one here, within Section 7, the resources are identified intentionally, um, and this, the resource section includes organizational knowledge. And it should be considered a uh, resource because it really is. It, it's a resource for us to use to build our processes, to make our processes better, faster, cheaper, stronger. And if we're not using it to that, in that capacity, we're missing the boat. We're missing the intent of the standard. Um, I can't tell you what that program has to look like because it's going to be dependent. It's going to be scalable based on the needs of your organization. But somehow we want to capture those lessons learned, capture the best practices or the benchmarked activities, and, and utilize those to our advantage. Um, and it could be, as we've demonstrated, through corrective action, through training, through uh, human factors, through competency, et cetera. There's a lot of places where it fits. It's not just revised procedures. There's a lot of aspects that go into this. Uh, the next bullet, knowledge creation or retention should be based on the organizational context and used to improve fulfillment of interested party needs and expectations. I um, think that's pretty self-explanatory, but we want to make sure that we're, we're capturing what's important to us and we define what's important to us through that interested parties, needs, and expectations piece. That's why the context of the organization is so important. And if you have a, a, a lack of understanding surrounding that context piece, we've got a webinar associated with that as well. I'd encourage you to go take a peek at it. Um, Really, the, the message, the underlying message there is we, we don't spin our wheels for the sake of spinning our wheels. We want to make sure that what we're doing is value added to our business, to our customers, to our interested parties or our stakeholders. So it's important for us to understand who those stakeholders are before we start going down the path of um, investing time into creating or retaining this organizational knowledge and focus on what's important to our interested parties so that we're not creating waste. Uh, there is an intentional interrelation across the standard, and it's, this isn't a standalone program. So we've seen through the slide deck, I showed you the interrelationships that exist between a number of different clauses. It's important for us to understand it's not a standalone activity. It's not something that we can you know, present a, an organizational knowledge matrix and satisfy the requirement of the standard. Um, what we're looking for as we audit this is to make sure that you are capturing the knowledge that's pertinent to your context. You're, you're making sure that in the light of these risks, whether it be um, retirements, whether it be um, the transitional nature of maybe a, uh, a millennial type candidate or employee, they, they tend to, you know, stereotyping, we, they tend to stay at a, an employer for a couple of years rather than the longevity that you've seen out of a uh, maybe a baby boomer or a Gen Xer. Um, so we want to make sure that we're capturing that knowledge and, and making sure it doesn't leave. Um, in addition, maybe there's some non-compete agreement type activity that has to occur so that we're not losing that knowledge to a competitor, so that people are forced to not leave us and go to a competitor for 
to maybe a more enticing salary. Um, a lot of lot of things to consider there. Um, the the last bullet here is reviewed through leadership, through management review, as a means of assessing resources. Because again, we know that this is a resource, and management is supposed to consider through or top management rather is supposed to consider through that management review activity the need for resources. So if this is a resource, the need for organizational knowledge, whether it be development or retention or definition, is something that should be considered. We need to make sure that we have what we need and that it's adequate. And if there are gaps that exist, those would be risks or opportunities. And those are the outputs associated with the management review process. So again, the standard is laced with all of this type of methodology throughout it. We just need to capitalize on the tools that are there and use them to our benefit rather than uh, just implementing for the sake of compliance. Marty, Mike, anything to add? That's the last slide in the implementation thoughts piece. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm not sure if Mike's on the line, but uh, oh, great job, Don. Uh, it was a good explanation. I just wanted to maybe give um, a couple of editorial comments on the uh, the requirement itself in 716, that's in both 9001 and AS9100 series of standards, is to your point with the, um, the scalability of this program, it's important to point out that this knowledge shall be maintained and made available to the extent necessary. So that scalability, it, it's going to be up to the top management of the organization to decide to what extent is it necessary? And if you go back to the previous um, sentence there, it says, for the operation of its processes and to achieve conformity of products and services. So there's the extent right there that you're looking for. Um, important to point out that most of the text in this requirement is in the bottom, in the two notes. Um, and as a practical matter, notes, are not requirements. Uh, we don't audit the notes themselves, but uh, the internal auditors uh, and the facilitators and developers of your system should be mindful that this is what the auditors are thinking of or looking at or considering when we're looking at your program for how you institutionalize tribal knowledge and uh, how you capture the knowledge uh, from people that are working for you uh, and from external sources as well. So that's all I had. Excellent. Thank you, Marty. Um, so let me go back to the end slide here. So the, the next section we talk about the resources that exist and where this information came from. And while we're doing this, you'll see a chat function on your computer. If you have any questions or any feedback, this is an opportunity for you to type that into the chat function, and we'll address those in just a moment. So go ahead and type your questions into there. We'll answer those in, in a few slides. While we're waiting for you to type those in, I'm going to debrief some of the resources and some of the, uh, the information that was utilized to create these webinars, and also the link to the other webinars that we referenced. So on the screen right now, you see a picture of the IAQG website, the International Aerospace Quality Group. Um, within this website, you'll have a few resources. Namely, the, the, the ones I want to point out are on the right-hand side and the left-hand side. The left-hand side is the Supply Chain Management Handbook. And if you haven't looked through this document, this is probably one of the coolest resources available uh, for free that describes best practices or a community of best practices for all things aerospace, all things manufacturing. And just because you're an ISO company doesn't mean you can't utilize some of this. These are not mandatory requirements, but these are great ideas on how to uh, implement kind of a best practices approach and maybe things to consider as you're, as you're implementing uh, different facets of your business. So certainly consider it. Um, the other side, on the right-hand side, you see the 9100 deployment support materials. 
and the IAQG standard questions. Both will take you to the same place. Um, this one takes you direct to 9100, the IAQG standard questions button will take you to a matrix that has all of the standards available and you can click on the, the specific link that takes you to the 9100, the 9110, or the 9120 documents. Um, and I point that one out because that's where the FAQs, frequently asked questions associated with the standard, reside. Along with that evaluator guidance material or the evaluation guidance material, it's probably one of the best documents for a new internal auditor or maybe a person whose internal auditing program could use a facelift. Go read through that document. It's written for third-party auditors to help explain what we're looking for or what we should be looking for, rather. So if you're utilizing that to help train or maybe um, redefine your internal auditing program, it, it should put you in a similar mindset as to what the third, third party auditors are going to be looking for, and it will help you to um, expand upon that a little. Again, if you're an ISO company, feel free to go grab them. These resources are free. They're available. Um, there's no registration required associated with that download. You just go access it. If you don't like it, don't use it. But it's there available for you. I'd recommend it. Um, on the NSF website, and you can see the uh, nsf.org backslash info backslash ISO dash updates address there. But on our website, under the AS9100 2016 tab, um, we have a section for our webinar series. And I'm sure we can get it updated on the ISO side as well to link to the webinars. Um, Katie will probably help me out with that. But we, we want to make sure we're pointing out where all these webinars are. We've done this now for about 16 months, I think. And we've done at least one a month for that period. And we've got topics ranging from KPIs to management review, best practices to organizational knowledge and anything in between. Um, these are free. These are available. We're using this as a means to calibrate both client and auditor on what the industry expects and what we can do to not only comply with the standard but to hopefully gain value out of it. So please go check those out. We also have a few other transition tools that are available on that website. And those include a transition guide, a gap assessment tool. We have an internal audit tool available. Um, please, please, please go use those. Uh, as the note says, these are optional resources. You do not have to use them. They are in no means or by no means required. And if you choose to use them, that's great. Um, they're free to take, free to use. You don't even have to leave the NSF logo on it if you don't want to. Make it your own format. We just created them to make the transition process easier because we, we didn't want you to fail. We want everybody to succeed through this process. Um, the last slide I have here is regarding the webinar topics for next month. Um, like I said, we're doing one a month. Ne next month we're going to do a bonus one. And there's a correlation between these. Um, the, the standard webinar is going to be on the um, contract review expectations and kind of best practices there. Um, so reviewing contracts to ensure that we truly understand what requirements exist and, and all of the fine print, if you will, and ensuring that we understand that prior to signing up to the order. Um, as, as we all know, it's too late in the game to go back later on and say, hey, wait a minute, it's going to cost me money for, or cost you extra money to get a, a first article performed or something to that effect, right? Um, so we want to talk through best practices associated with that. And, and in correlation to that, there's a new requirement. Uh, I shouldn't say new. It came out in 2015, but it was recently... Uh, or the, the line in the sand was, uh, for compliance rather, was, was uh, December 31st of 2017. So it's recently invoked, uh, recently became mandatory that we had to have compliance for any contract that touches a DOD or DFAR slowdown. Um, so if you're doing government work at any degree of the supply chain or any level of the supply chain, you probably need to be familiar um, wink, wink, with NIST SP 800-171. Um, the, the requirement is there. It has to be, uh, you have to have compliance by December 31st. And if you've never heard of this before, I would certainly go look at it. 
um, make sure that you're compliant because it's going to be a hot button topic for the next few months. Um, making sure that all of the supply chain is, is on board with that. Um, but we're going to have some of the NSF expertise associated with our uh, information security group um, talking about what NIST 800-171 is and the uh, uh, sorry, 27,000 series requirements are. Um, so stay tuned for that. More information to come. Last slide. Um, has contact information for, for Mike and me. Um, I'm going to go to a different slide so you can see Marty's contact information as well. And this is the point where we're going to start answering any questions that come up. So uh, first one here is, uh, is tactical and tactic knowledge the same? Yes, it was intended to be the same, um, just different different schools of thought, different methodologies, and different uh, uh, authors that contributed to that. So yes, tactic and tactical knowledge were one and the same. Um, will this presentation be available again? I would love for our staff management to have the opportunity to view it. And I believe Katie addressed that, but I'll mention it in a larger audience. Yes, absolutely. The recorded session will be available on that website. Uh, the NSF website that I showed you. And then as an attendee or a registered attendee, you're going to receive an email link with a copy of the uh, presentation in a PDF. Uh, the video probably won't play through that PDF, but you can search the, the web for Jocko Willink Good, and you'll have the spelling of his name in there, and you can play that video for the team if you'd like. Or you can play the webinar off of the website that Katie will mention in the email. Um, the next question says, can you share an example of the proper documentation of transforming tribal knowledge into organizational knowledge? Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and this is just an example. But if I have a particular sequence that has to occur, otherwise we get failure, um, it can be simply a matter of, of building that into a traveler or building a a line into the traveler that says this has to be done before this. In a lot of cases, that knowledge is going to be retained by specific employees. Um, and as I'm doing um, the, the retirement thing, we may lose some of that knowledge. So planning for that retirement through a, a good succession management program and understanding when people intend to retire, maybe having some job shadowing type uh, activities so that they can understand those different nuances of the job and, and the tribal knowledge, if you will, that goes along with it. Um, that, that's an example of retaining that organizational knowledge. It doesn't necessarily have to be documented, right? Um, using an on-the-job training type approach is a means for us to, to communicate effectively one piece to another. Now, we all know that everybody's going to take that tribal knowledge and uh, through that on-the-job training, and they're not going to retain all of it. It's just based on the theory of adult learning. We only keep a portion of what we're told. So there may be some additional need for a more uh, refined approach, like the traveler, like training to a work instruction or a, uh, a recipe card or something to that effect, just so that we have it. But that's going to be based on the needs of the organization, the criticality of the operation, and maybe the product. It's all going to be dependent. If um, I can just uh, add an um, example as well, Don. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in the case where if you're a uh, machining environment or injection molding environment, um, and you, know, you notice your scrap rates from machine to machine or from shift to shift are changing, uh, there may be things in the setup guide that somebody's doing different in setting up a, a CNC machine or injection molding equipment differently than other people, trying to get that from them, interviewing them, doing it as an internal audit, and then institutionalizing it by saying, hey, we need to change the setup guide, the setup parameters, so that we're more consistent in our approach of making uh, acceptable products. And, and paradoing out the defect data associated and maybe creating a, a, a pokey oak to the fixture, the setup fixture, so that we don't have parts loaded backwards or, you know, raised up in the machine as the, the head comes across or the insert comes across it. Exactly. So, excellent example. 
Any other questions? I think that's the last one that I see. So with that, I'd like to say on behalf of NSF, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for attending. Um, stay tuned for more information surrounding the next webinars. And if you have any thoughts or questions, you have our contact information, we would be happy to share or uh, address any, any of those questions that you may have. So we're Okay. Well, thank I, you very Mike, much, John, for your thank for your uh, for conducting the webinar today, and thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Again, like Don said, and I said at the beginning, you will receive a follow-up email with all of this information to be able to download, and I will conveniently put links to the other webinars that Don referenced within this webinar, so that you can easily access past webinars as well. So, thank you again, and look forward to seeing you guys at future events. Cheers.